up to the minute coverage of Operation Desert Storm here on Channel 7. I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters in New York. We've been keeping our eye on the Middle East. You may have heard the Defense Secretary say today the U.S. will be ready for a ground assault before the end of February. Today, the Air Force has been using its so-called smart bombs to stop the oil flow into the Gulf started by the Iraqis. American pilots bombed a network of pipes carrying the oil into the Gulf from oil storage tanks on the Kuwait coast. That spill is now 35 miles long and 10 miles wide. Marine officers say Iraq has laid half a million mines, mines in Kuwait, turning it into one big minefield. It has been unusually quiet so far tonight in the Gulf. It's already three in the morning in Saudi Arabia, and the only thing we are able to see in the night sky for a change is the moon. No reports of Scud missiles. We'll be back at halftime. Now let's go back to Tampa. And ABC will return with Peter Jennings and the ABC News team after this message from the NFL and a word from our ABC station. Nine X believes children have a better idea of where they're going when they know where they've come from. Up to the minute coverage of Operation Desert Storm here on Channel 7. I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters. We're going to take a few minutes at the beginning of halftime here to get as much up to date as we can with a number of developments in the war today. Remember before it began, Saddam Hussein said he would use the oil weapon? Well, he did. And now the most significant U.S. attack of the last 24 hours has been to turn the oil off at a place called Mina al-Mahdi, where the Iraqis had pumped more than 100 million gallons of oil into the Persian Gulf, threatening U.S. military operations and Saudi Arabia's drinking water. U.S. F-111s using laser-guided weapons have tried to seal the pipes. Here's ABC's Bill Redeker. The oil had been spilling into the Gulf for eight days. It was set on fire accidentally during a skirmish two days ago between the U.S. Navy and Iraqi patrol boats. This is what it looked like yesterday, before American warplanes bombed its supply lines. And this is what General Schwarzkopf said it looked like today, after the attack. This is early today. Uh, you will see that you have an entirely different color smoke coming out of here. We see the size of the flame area is much, much smaller than the one you saw uh, just a few minutes ago. The attack was carried out by F-111s, which fired two smart bombs at two sets of manifolds or supply pipes. You're looking right through the nose of the, of the guided munition as it's flown straight into the small manifold area to destroy it. The general said it would be at least a day before the military could be sure it had stopped the flow of oil. But some of the oil already in the Gulf has entered culverts in Saudi Arabia that feed desalting plants, the source of most drinking water here. The Saudis say other plants will provide sufficient water until the oil slick is broken up, and General Schwarzkopf says the oily mess will not change Allied war plans. It's not a desirable thing, but uh, it's certainly not something that's going to impede the progress uh, of, of the operation, and I don't think it's going to bring pressure to bear to do anything different than what we're doing right now. General Schwarzkopf said because Saddam Hussein had threatened to flood the Gulf with oil, the military had expected it. But he warned there are a lot of surprises to come. Bill Redeker, ABC News, Saudi Arabia. That oil, as Bill said, has been gushing out of pipes at a huge loading terminal where tankers come to fill up. The slick is 10 miles wide and 35 miles long, oozing down along the Kuwaiti coastline as far as Kafchi, a town right on the Saudi border. And there's another refinery there, which was shelled last week, and oil from Kafchi is also in the water. ABC's Ned Potter on the problem of trying to track it. The oil is thick, it is toxic, and it is moving south about 13 miles a day. Forecasters say unless the currents change, it could, in two or three days, reach the city of Jubail, site of the largest desalting plant in the world. These facilities are either now protected or in the process of being protected. The Saudi government says it has placed two long floating barriers around the plant with specially designed boats on patrol to skim off any oil that gets past the barriers and close to the underwater intakes. So unless the oil actually sinks to the bottom of the sea, it wouldn't affect the desalination plants. Also, they have filter systems. But it's still a big problem to clean up all that oil. Experts learn from past accidents that they met their crew. Those floating barriers, for instance, are useless if the seas become choppy. So American companies are offering the Saudis newer technology to spread microbes that literally eat oil off the beach. 
That method has only been used since the Exxon Valdez. Uh, until we all get down there, uh, you'll never know. We're, we're writing the book as we go here, just as we have in every other uh, oil spill. Most of the cleanup will just happen with time. Some of the oil will evaporate, some will sink, and some will scar the Persian Gulf for years. Ned Potter, ABC News, New York. The military high command says the air war continues to be completely one-sided. There have been no U.S. losses for two days now. Four more Iraqi jets have been shot down. Along the front, the Marines have exchanged artillery fire with the Iraqis again. There's been skirmishing along the Saudi-Kuwaiti frontier in one form or the other for several days. But ABC's Bob Zell reports in today that no one is rushing for the land war to start. Pentagon officials say the U.S. is in no hurry to begin a ground campaign and intends to rely on air attacks for an additional period of weeks. Recent Allied bombing sorties have taken out nearly all bridges across the southern Euphrates River, the key supply route for Iraqi infantry forces in Kuwait. According to intelligence sources, these troops now have less than two weeks' provisions left. In addition, military sources say new damage assessments show bombing taking an increasingly heavy toll on tanks, ammunition stockpiles, and mobile air defense systems attached to the Republican Guard. Adding to U.S. reluctance not to rush into a ground campaign is the fact that some vital supplies are still en route. For example, a battalion of 58 M1A1 tanks to replace the older M60 tanks in Marine divisions will not reach Saudi Arabia until mid-February. Other units, which are now fully supplied, have yet to move into their final positions. Nearly everyone at the Pentagon agrees that the air campaign will not eliminate the need for a ground operation to retake Kuwait. But continued effective bombing could mean a shorter war with fewer U.S. casualties. Bob Zelnick, ABC News at the Pentagon. Thank you, Bob. Once again today, we have not seen very much of the war, but once again, we've come upon one of those isolated moments that makes it so clear what it may yet be all about. As tanks and men move closer to the front lines, the men will need to rely on these tanks as minesweepers. Ahead of them are deadly obstacles. The advancing U.S. forces know that Saddam Hussein has the largest collection of mines in military history. Everybody was supplying him. He was our ally till August. We gave him a bunch of stuff. The Kuwaitis gave him money to go buy state-of-the-art. The Saudis gave him money to buy state-of-the-art. He also went out with his own money. There's other problems. When he went into Kuwait, he captured all that stuff. Marine Major George Kutchell, who's a specialist in mine defenses, is determined the troops will know what a threat they have to face. He's got tow poppers. He's got claymores. He's got poppers out there. He's got signal flares. If you get up to some fence, you can guarantee it there's a mine in it. There are large areas in the Falklands still fenced off because of these kind of mines. They're tow poppers. They're very effective. He was buying these in lots of 300000 for $4.80. He bought up to $7 million of them. He tells them the Iraqis have laid all sorts of mines across a 40-mile front, and some of the mines have American technology. That man has a built-in anti-handling device, a mercury switch. You pick this mine up, it goes off. You eat five pounds of explosives. Explosives in the human body don't get along. This ain't the war to be out there playing Rambo. The guy knows what he's doing. He likes landmines. Only a tiny fraction of American soldiers have any combat experience. The Major paints it as real as he can. If you find one of these, you're going to win it. You're going to eat about 14 pounds of explosives. They're not going to find your shoes. They're not going to find nothing. See a little red mist there. How many mines? Intelligence reports put their number at half a million laid so far. That is one for every member of the Allied forces. And then there are the chemical weapons. The head of the Israeli air defense said today he works on the assumption that every missile attack is a chemical one. Joining us briefly, our military analyst, Tony Cordesman. Tony, everybody wants to have a crack at Iraq's chemical weapons, but how do you get at them? It's very difficult, Peter. They have tens of thousands of bombs, hundreds of thousands of artillery rounds. They're probably now scattered in hundreds of small sites through the, throughout the front and the rear area going to be extremely difficult to get to them. How serious a threat? It's a very serious threat. We may be able to bypass it. It's slow to move, but very serious. Can you be a little more specific as to uh, whether or not you think it'll be a major issue when the ground war begins? I think that depends purely on Saddam Hussein. If he chooses to use it, it can slow us down. It can greatly increase our casualties. Okay, Tony Cordesman, thanks very much. We, of course, have no idea 
how many Iraqi soldiers are dying in those Allied bombing attacks, but the Iraqi Foreign Minister Tariq Aziz said today that the U.S. and its allies, including Israel, were trying to destroy Iraq. Tariq Aziz wrote to the U.N. Secretary General telling Mr. Perez de Cuellar that he was personally responsible for what the Iraqis call these ugly crimes. As you know, all the news from both sides in this war is heavily censored. ABC's Sheila McVicker has the latest summary of what the Iraqis want the world to see. These are the only images Iraq is permitting the world to see today. Foreign journalists were taken to a suburb of the holy city of an najaf the Iraqis say 27 people died here. This woman says she was at prayer when bombs fell on her house a week ago. She says her son's house was among five blocks of homes in a residential neighborhood destroyed by the bombing. But this man says there was a military garrison nearby. I think some, uh, some military units or something like that. But I saw my family completely, uh, my uh, relatives completely dead. One of the holiest shrines of Islam is less than two miles away. Inside this mosque is the tomb of Ali, the founder of the Shia sect. Iraq has accused the Allies of deliberately damaging holy places. Journalists report they could see no damage to the mosque. The argument is important. Most Iraqis are Shia Muslims, so are Iranians. Diplomats say they believe Iraq's claims of attacks on holy places are intended to draw Iran into the conflict on Iraq's side. Sheila McVicker, ABC News, Amman. While Iran has said it will not take sides, the Speaker of the Iranian Parliament did say today that Iran would fight Israel if the Israelis come into the war. As for now, Iran is a fairly safe place for some Iraqi pilots. The U.S. says that 39 Iraqi planes, fighter planes, have sought refuge there since the war began, and 23 in the last 24 hours alone. Iran says they will stay until the war is over. On, Iraqi reports that its civilians are being hit by Allied planes. General Schwarzkopf said today, these things happen in war. He told of the time he was a commander in Vietnam, and the U.S. Air Force accidentally bombed him. He then went on to say that America is being very cautious. By requiring that the pilots fly in a certain direction of flight or use a certain type of munition that requires them to go to altitudes that they normally wouldn't be required to go to, those pilots are at much more risk than they would be otherwise. But we have deliberately decided to do this in order to avoid unnecessary civilian casualties, in order to avoid destroying these religious shrines and that sort of thing. And, and I think we should be pretty, trying to clean up my act, pretty proud of the young men who are out there and willing to do that in order to minimize damage of this nature. A couple of other brief items. The pilot of a Navy plane was flying over a tiny island off the Kuwaiti coast today when he spotted a group of 20 to 30 Iraqi soldiers who had spelled out the message SOS, we surrender, using stones. The Navy says they are probably hungry as well as scared and a team will be sent back to see if they were serious. It is, by the way, the middle of the night in the Middle East. There's not been a scud attack so far today on either Saudi Arabia or Israel. In Israel, six attacks in the last 10 days and 3,500 homes have been damaged in the greater Tel Aviv area. Want to check in with the White House and the State Department. First at the White House, Britt Hume. What's been going on there today, Britt? Well, Peter, a potentially troublesome diplomatic situation has arisen. When the president came back late this afternoon from Camp David, he faced a meeting tomorrow with Soviet Foreign Minister Alexander Bishmertnik, who has been in town over the weekend. The president is probably going to tell Bishmertnik at that meeting that the U.S.-Soviet summit scheduled for next month is off. At the same time, however, he will not be eager to encourage further criticism of the U.S.'s bombing of Iraq in the Gulf operation, which Bishmertnik voiced before leaving Moscow. Uh, the U.S. is going to cancel the summit or postpone the summit, largely because of the situation in the Baltics, although the president will not say so. But at the same time, the last thing the president needs now is the Soviets turning away from the U.S. at all on the Gulf. The Soviets, as you know, have been a critical diplomatic partner in getting the U.N. resolutions passed. So the president faces a tricky task in his meeting tomorrow. Okay, Britt, thanks very much. Britt Hume at the White House. We're over at the State Department now. ABC's John McCarthy. Yes, John. Peter, the Secretary of State faces also a difficult situation. One of the primary fears the U.S. has faced here is that the coalition will somehow come apart during these critical days of the war. Tomorrow he meets with a foreign minister of Egypt who is here to talk to him at least partly about finances, but also about a case of nerves which seems to be embracing the Egyptian capital these days. The U.S. is also, of course, very concerned about Israel. 
uh, arguing with the Israelis that if they enter the war, they will be giving Saddam Hussein exactly what he wants, so that diplomatic effort will continue as well. Try to put it in plain, brief language. Has there been any serious change in the coalition, any serious quake in the coalition since a week ago? The coalition has stayed together extremely well, Peter. Uh, now what the U.S. is trying to do is to work at the margins when they begin to detect uh, problems. Secretary Baker is going after him. Okay, John McCrethy at the State Department. And just before we go back to the game, an answer to one of the more obvious questions of the day. Yes, men and women in the war zone have been able to see the first half. ABC's Judd Rose is in Saudi Arabia, and he explains how. It began with the national anthem dedicated to the troops in the Persian Gulf. And in the Gulf, they were listening. You see the national anthem at home all the time, and you just... It's, it just goes by, but here it's got, it's got meaning behind it. Here in eastern Saudi Arabia, it's Super Bowl Monday. With the time difference, the game began past 2 in the morning. It was late, it was cold, it didn't matter. 3 in the morning or 6 in the morning. Anytime, it's football is my style. About 75 soldiers watched the game at Camp Jack, a lonely stretch of asphalt on the edge of a large Saudi air base. No liquor here, so they had soda and popcorn and gas masks. Saddam has a history of hitting us right when we're in the middle of something good. <laughs> what happens if it happens? Oh, put on our mask and hopefully be able to keep watching if, if it's not too bad. There had been concern this week that playing the Super Bowl in the shadow of war seemed frivolous. But if anything, it meant more to the troops here, a glimpse of home before heading on to the front. Judd Rose, ABC News, Eastern Saudi Arabia. Small reason to smile today. It's a little after 4 o'clock in the morning in Saudi Arabia. That's our... Brief news report. We'll go back to the game in Tampa just after this. I'm Peter Jennings. Have a good evening. I'm Peter Jennings at ABC News headquarters in New York. All sorts of people descending on the Persian Gulf tonight from the U.S., from Norway and Sweden to try to deal with all that oil that the U.S. says Iraq has spilled into the sea. The slick is now 35 miles long. U.S. bombers attacked the controls at the oil terminal in Mina El Madi earlier today to try to shut it down and they should know by tomorrow if it worked. Most Western reporters have been kicked out of Iraq, but one of the few left works for the Canadian press, Wire Service, the story of war. Lila Deeb reports today that one Iraqi man who moved his family out of Baghdad last weekend to escape the Allied bombing went to a home in the country only to find it had been flattened by a direct hit. The commander of U.S. forces, General Norman Schwarzkopf, said today, U.S. pilots are taking extraordinary risks to avoid hitting civilian targets, but war, he said, is not a clean business. We'll be here, as usual, every hour on the hour. They're still watching the game in Saudi Arabia. Now back to Tampa for the fourth quarter.